Tony, welcome to the Mentors Military Podcast. When you decided to go into the Air Force, was uh, your initial step going into pararescue, or did you go a different route initially? Um, yeah, I did. I went a, a different route. Uh, so I grew up in Elkhart, Indiana, close to South Bend, Indiana, right outside of uh, the Notre Dame area. And um, I wasn't sure really what I wanted to do. Um, the only thing I was sure of is that, and this is probably even more important, you don't always have to have all the answers, but uh, if you know what you don't like, then that can that can be a good steering factor for you. And so I, I knew I wasn't ready for college. And I just went down one day and I, um, I signed up at the recruiter and I initially tried to join the army. Oh, did you? Um, and it, I did. I tried to join the army. Um, and if you guys remember this, back then in 1988, they actually had a policy in place that if you were flat footed, you couldn't get into the army. And so, you know, I, I was. I do remember uh, that. Yeah. So I, which I, I didn't, I was a young guy. I found it very bizarre because I was a wrestler. I was an athlete. I was actually, you know, captain of the wrestling team and. And, um, but the recruiter's like, Hey, I, I apologize just by the, the, the way the mandate is right now and the regulations, we can't take anybody with flat feet. So I did a, I did a button hook right out of his office and I walked right next door to the air force recruiter. And I said, Hey, look at, um, I'm not sure what I want to do, but I know I don't want to stay in Indiana. I'd like to travel and, and, uh, see what else is out there. Um, so you know, I'm, I'm, I'm athletic, you know, what do you have to offer? And basically he said, no problem. We'll get you, we'll get you signed up. Don't worry about the flat footed thing. Uh, you can come join the air force. And I immediately signed up and, um, but he never said anything about pararescue. So I didn't know about pararescue initially. What I end up doing is he signed me up for uh, security forces. So okay. I was, a, I was a security forces guy um, for, uh, those first couple of years, basically my first two assignments out of the air force, I was a, a security forces. Um, I, I, I probably was the one class where the no, normally the way it's done is when you're going through basic training, the indoc instructors come in and they, they say, Hey, is there anybody in this class? It doesn't matter what your AFSC is your MOS or rate, but for the air force, it's AFSC, you know that. Mm -hmm. Um, so they come in and offer you a chance to try out for pararescue combat control, uh, so I must have been sick that day or I never heard about that or they never or they just missed our flight. So I never knew about it. And uh, and I and I went on to be a cop and I was happy being a cop. Um, I did some time in Minot, North Dakota, and then I went to Misawa, Japan. And a lot of a lot of PJs don't even know this. But while I was in Misawa, Japan, we opened up a pararescue unit there for a very, very short time. So we actually had one in Misawa uh, who was there for, you know, Maybe it might have been two years, but when that team came in, I started to hang out with those guys and, uh, um, you know, I was into working out. I, they were into working out and, and one thing led to another. They were showing me basically what sold it for me. I, I guess at the time is they had these portfolios, you know, and they were just showing me all this, you know, crazy stuff. You know, they were climbing, they were skydiving, they were shooting and it was just so far from the stuff I was doing and it just looked so exciting that uh, I said, that's what I want to do. Uh, and subsequently what happened was the guy I was hanging out with who uh, later on I would end up working for him and I would come back together full circle. You know, he, he initially gave me the pass test. Uh, he must have known me pretty well, you know, maybe or maybe that's just how they do it. And, you know, mentally they try to get in your head a little bit, but there was a really high attrition rate. Uh, at NDOC and he basically said, I don't think you can do it. I don't, you know, you're, you're fit, you know, you're a good guy. you got a great personality, Tony. Um, trying to challenge you, huh? Yeah. You know, and he just, but he goes, but you know, it's a high attrition rate and I just don't, I, I, I don't think you could do it. Damn. And, and I, and I was just uh, floored and I said, well, you know what, I'm going to prove you wrong. And so the initially, you know, it was almost a, I, I went in kind of on that challenge, you know, to kind of show this guy that I could do it. Um, because I liked them, I, you know, and there was some, some peer pressure to perform and, um, and I wanted to test myself, I guess at, at a younger age, I wanted to test myself. Yeah. Yeah. You know, in backing up though, what's so interesting about that story is so many of us actually walk into the recruiting stations and see, 
you know, Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines, and, you know, maybe at times Coast Guard and stuff. But although in my office, I never saw Coast Guard. But at any rate, you walk down through there, and I've heard so many stories, especially doing this podcast, of fellow, you know, guys who serve in the uh, the service who who actually walk down the hall. And one of the first offices that, that they go to, including myself, was the Air Force office. Yeah. And, you know, the Air Force, you know, of course, I thought, you know, I could fly coming straight out of high school. I wanted to know if I could or what the pipeline was. The guy blew me off, had no interest in talking to me. And that's the reason why I went down and started talking to other services. Yeah. And here, and here you walk into the, the army first and oh no, man, we don't want you. And you end up going to the air force totally backwards from what most people end up doing. And, yeah. And, and then not only that, but you end up going into a really good career field in terms of being able to translate to the private sector um, and see an opportunity out there in special operations, but you really had no idea what you were getting yourself into other than just the conversations you had with the guys, right? Uh, within yeah. the gym. Yeah. So how oh, was sorry. that pipeline once you went in? Was it, cause I mean, it's like what, two years? It's about, yeah, it's two years, a two year, uh, uh a two year pipeline is considered fast. You know, mm. it's not uncommon, you know, and you know, you guys know how it is, uh, Scott, you know, with the SAS, I imagine, um, both of you guys, you know, you can get broken along the way. You can be an airborne, break your leg. You can be yeah. doing some fast roping. So, so guys, you know, they get attrited or, you know, cycled back. So it's not uncommon, to, you know, for guys, but I had a relatively fast pipeline, you know, it, it went, uh, two years, um, the indoctrination course, the first course, the PJ school indoctrination course down there in San Antonio, um, was a tough course. It's the toughest. We attrit. We get a lot of our attrition up front in the, at the PJ school there, and then uh, subsequently, with, when you go through the pipeline, we don't we don't lose too many people. And then there's another little spike on the tail end when you go to the PJ schoolhouse because of the academics. Uh, you know, they take you from not knowing anything up to a full full blown paramedic. You know, mm. and so that's a pretty steep curve. So there's another little spike right there, but. For the most part, if you can get through the first indoctrination course, um, you know, outside of, you know, having a jump and breaking your leg or something like that, you should make it through. And then the next the next uh, high point is over there in Albuquerque. But, yeah, I trained really, really, really hard um, for that first course or for pararescue, you know, because, you know, I had, you know, I was hanging out with those guys. And and again, they I wanted to challenge myself. They wanted to challenge me. And uh um, and I thought I was in phenomenal shape. I, I was in really phenomenal shape. My body fat was really low. I, you know, I'm kind of a little bit sh- you know, short on the shorter side, but, you know, uh, a little bit more on the muscular side. But I could still, you know, I, I still ran uh, my calisthenics. I trained really, really, really hard. But in retrospect, I, I wish I would even put more time in the pool. The 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 water the water con, you know, that's, it doesn't matter what service you in, you're, you're in that, uh, that kind of, uh, levels the playing field. Why? Cause we're terrestrial creatures. Okay. So, you know, you could sandbag on land if people were into sandbag and you could probably take a rest or whatever you fall to your knees and you're hurt, but you can't do that in, in a, in a, in a water confidence course, you know, where you spend half the days in the water because you're sinking to the bottom. So everybody's fighting for air. There's no sandbagging in there. Um, so, uh, yeah, it was tough. It's a tough course, but, um, they didn't get you prepared for that part of it. They didn't like say, Hey man, this is going to be one of the toughest things. Let's go jump in the pool. And you know, <laughs> they um, decided to leave that part out, Tony, what yeah, happened? No, well, so back when I went through, no, you know, think about where we were with the internet and all the C2 that you could get on things. Yeah. They didn't really talk about it much. And the guys who I was hanging out with just happened to go, yeah, you'll figure it out. Just like we figured it out. So they just said get in really good shape and spend a lot of time in the water and, and balance it out with your calisthenics and you'll get through it. It's not like that these days. You know, we uh, obviously we're, we're trying to there's fundamentally there's some philosophical differences on how we train guys and we try to give them as much time as we can. There's a lot of C2 they can gather and uh, um and for the most courses out there, you can see a lot of it on, you can get a lot off the internet, a lot off of YouTube, and you can train to the 10th week or 12th week or 16th week standard. And, uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, no doubt about it. Actually, there's probably, um, several 
former PJs or uh, people that came from that community that are of the Air Force, you know, AFSOC or whatever, that are training individuals who may be preparing to even go. So, you know, yep. for them even enlisting or once they've enlisted, it's all right. Like, you know, we're going to put you within a pipeline to get you geared up for what you could expect. That's and, right. Uh, yeah, there's several programs that are. There are, like that. Uh, there, there are definitely, and it sounds like we know a, a, a lot of our mutual friends who are involved in those, but they're definitely, yeah. you know, doing what they feel they need to do to, to get the next generation of warriors prepped and, and get those pipelines full for the, be able to, you know, kind of fight the next battles. You well, know? you think about that, uh, you know, it's already a small number of individuals that are probably going to meet the qualifications or at least have the interest in doing so and then meet the qualifications. And then there's even a smaller number, you know, as you start weeding them out, that's going to make it through the indoctrination. And the fact that I know I've heard recently pararescue is one of those things that, um, you know, there's a lot of guys as a burnout factor, you know, so there's a lot of guys that are trading out. And so then you've got all of these these gaps that the service needs to fill. Um, so these types of pipelines are great ways in which really you're training the, the next generation, like you just said. You're getting yep. them prepared so that they're going to be successful without the military have to spend hard-earned dollars. Let the individual, you know, contribute to that cost because then they have a greater passion and a desire to complete it. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, I mean, make no bones about it. If I would have known about something like that, and I think many guys would, why would you not if you if you, if you you had the extra dollars and you could afford? And, and man, I don't, I don't even think they're charging that much, most yeah. of the guys I talk to. but. Um, if that's something you had aspirations for and you had the mentorship and the guidance early on to kind of or the situational awareness to know that, hey, I want to go be an operator. I, I man, I'd be doing everything I possibly could. That's what we tell all our operators anyways, is is to, you know, try to get as much C2 as you possibly can. Know, know your enemy, um, know yourself, uh, know your team. So, uh, man, to to put what you can physically and mentally in the best position to, uh, for success, then man, absolutely. You know? Yeah. Um, I think there's a reoccurring theme with a lot of guests we have on from, from different backgrounds that the, the, the training phase or the, uh, the selection phase involves water that people often say is the hardest part. And I think people underestimate, uh, you, you made a great comment, Tony, about was us being terrestrial animals, you know, when we belong on land and stood up on two feet. And when you put people in water, I think they massively underestimate it. You know, just the amount of energy you get sapped because of the water temperature, the the different muscle groups. And, you know, people think I'll, I'll go and do some training and just jump in the pool and swim lengths. You know, and, and that's working your shoulders and different muscle groups. But then when you put somebody in, you know, treading water for long periods of time or uh, with clothing on or carrying different equipment or doing different tasks in the water, it just hugely takes it out of people. And you talk about that burnout rate of people burning out. And I, I, I would suggest or guess really that there's something to do with that amount of muscle groups that are being used in those water um evolutions that people just haven't trained and they haven't worked towards and built up and you know that just overtaking your body and really ramping up the fatigue uh, level and <clears throat> you know you're right the military spends a lot of money in training people and getting them ultimately it wants them to pass because it needs uh, operators but it needs the best operators that it can get and i think you know that that build up and getting some good training in the water so you know what could you offer any advice for anybody who's who's thinking about being an operator tony and there's there's water elements to the selection process oh yeah yeah absolutely um because man it, it, it most of those services at some point it was some at some course you're going to go through whether it's a combat dive course or something like that or whether it's the end doctor or buds you know, um, you're going to spend some time in the water. You know, the physical component that, you know, when they have these physical assessment, assessment programs and, and things like that, you know, obviously we all know it's the mental, the mental toughness and you're trying to test the mental. But to get to the mental, the fastest way we can assess people is to put them in physical stressing type of things. That's why we opt for the water. That's why we opt for, you know, to put a rucksack on them and run them and then have them get emotionally and physically exhausted because then that gets us to the mental, you know. But the water component, 
So, yeah, when guys tell me that like, hey, yeah, hey, I, I'm getting some time in the pool, I'm swimming laps and this and that, I'm always like, okay, well, you just can't make it all about swimming laps, man, you know. Um, that That is why, at least my experience, when I went through NDOC, we had a couple – we had a couple of guys who surfed and there was a guy, there was a college polo player and these guys actually did very, very well. And I think it's the component mixed with, they were comfortable in the water. And there's a big difference between being comfortable in the water and then getting in the water to swim laps, you know, mm. putting, the, putting, putting the laps on. And I, and I always tell the guys, I go, getting comfortable in the water is probably in my head, the tougher of the two. So if you can learn to be comfortable in the water, because down there at Indoc, and when you go to Buds and any of these type of courses, they're they're not just putting you in the water to, to swim laps. It's like you're upside you're upside down and backwards, being flipped. You know, a, a, a zodiac falls on your head, and now you're pinned underwater. You're tying knots. They're doing everything to kind of discombobulate you and make you all confused. So you really you really want to train being comfortable in the water. So that is one thing I tell them. I go, you got to go past just getting in the water and swimming laps, man. So, you know, obviously we joke around. We're like, uh, hey, uh, you know, find a couple guys, take them to the pool with you, find some guys who don't like you very much and have them go down there and just dunk <laughs> on you a little bit. You know, you know, I say it in jest, but, but you know, hey. I'm kind of serious too yeah. because, because the instructors, they're just trying to kill you, you know? But by the time you leave courses like that, you do feel, man, I, I think I could do anything, man. When, you, when you've when you been underwater and you're out of breath and you're just totally getting crushed and four instructors are on you just doing everything they can to not let you to the top, well, you know, you, it, it prepares you for all the stressors that you're going to feel, you know, when it comes to going to war and all the uncertainty, you know, and, and the confusion. That's what they're preparing you for is being able to deal with that stuff, really. Yeah, several yeah. several months ago, I can't remember when it, it exactly it was. It might have actually been about a, a year or more ago. There was a PJ that shared a video of jumping in off the helo, hitting into high seas. It looked like they were probably you know eight, ten, fifteen feet seas, and I mean choppy as all get out. Rotor blade wash, you know, coming down and then having to swim a fairly good distance to the rope and climb that rope back into that helicopter. Yeah, and yeah. Holy cow. Yeah, that was enough to break sweat on me and make me think, holy, yeah, no, yeah, it's it's very different. And and you're right, you're not going to experience that necessarily within a pool, but they try to create that in such a way, you know, that you're going to deal with adversity and circumstances um, like what you're going to do out there in the real life, you know, and Absolutely. trying to save a life. Yep, yeah. I'll, I'll tell you the, ter cool. the, the terrifying one uh is just what you said. Absolutely. You're absolutely right. But, uh, it's when you're paying the, you're, when you're playing the patient and a, and a litter that's in the water scenario oh. and you're hooked up to the helicopter and you're playing the patient <laughs> and the helicopter starts going forward and they're, they're trolling you through the water and you're underwater and you can just barely, I mean, it's, it, it can be terrifying. Oh you know? my God. Yeah. yeah. Do you have because, any because, radio because contact? Well, you know, well, when you're the patient that, you know, your PJ brothers who are helping you out, they're the ones talking to them like, Hey, <laughs> you know, they're, they're screaming up to them. But, like uh, that, yeah. That's scary because, you know, you're confined, you're confined in the litter and you know how it is. Any one of us, you know, now I really can't even help myself. I'm just along for the ride. You know, it's uh, wherever this pilot wants to take you. It's just Holy terrifying. Cow. I think pool water and, and seawater are two different beasts as well, Tony, aren't they? Yeah, you yep. know, it, pe people can be <clears throat> comfortable in uh, arduous or, or extreme circumstances in, in in a pool situation, you know. But you know, ultimately, you can you can you know, there's good visibility. You can put your feet down at, at some point, and you can sink down, and, and eventually it'll come to the bottom. In in the sea with swell and and waves, it's a totally different beast. And I, I guess that comes back to when you said surfers you know uh, who've gone on the course did really well because they, they've they just got a comfort of being in seawater and getting used to taking seawater in and you know instantly not throwing up and and panicking and, and you know the burning sensation you get in your nose and it, it's, it's just a different animal being in the sea isn't it compared to uh, uh, fresh water or, or pool water oh yeah absolutely and uh yeah and the, and the surfers, I always thought it's because, yeah, they're getting pummeled. They've been penned on quarrel. 
they they get hit over the head and their surfboard takes off and they they're still used to being tossed around and uh, you know the other thing is you know those cables you know now you got me thinking about helicopters and cables but you know it's really dangerous when you 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 lose control of the cable like the end so it's attached to the lid or all the way to the helicopter but when they start loading too much of that cable and now it's in the water that's really dangerous you know you got this cable oh, yeah, down there it that wrap can, around you yeah it can wrap around your leg you know man it'll take your leg off you know uh, you know i've seen so many accidents you know my buddy when we were in italy you know he, he it got it you wouldn't think about it but it can make a tight little knot that cable it's really fine it's pliable and it can make a small little knot it's hard to believe but you know he had his thumb taken clean off it just wrapped right around his thumb just when we were doing hoist operations over there in italy and it took his thumb clean off it's unfortunate Jeez. but you gotta really pay you know all those little tiny things you know and i love water work i think yeah. it's just fun you know being underneath the helicopter the spray but make no bones about it you know one one lapse and and judgment it could cost you or cost somebody dearly i think what's uh for me most impressive about pjs is the training that you guys go uh, do go through you know the various different types of situations that they place you within um, and you constantly train towards because in any given day there may be a situation where you're going to be called upon to go make a rescue and you don't know where that down pilot or where that person is that you need to be aiding is going to be and yep. so you train for any and every environment which is i think somewhat different than most medics you know yep. within all the other services uh, and I think it's one of the reasons why you guys are considered a lot more of the elite, at least in my mind, I would probably p uh, place you guys. And then from the medicine standpoint, definitely you guys. And then, you know, Ranger medics, uh, you know, in the army and stuff, very close. Although yeah. you probably disagree with that. You, you, I see the smile on your face. Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> There's, I, 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 I've worked with all the counterparts, you know, all of our sister services and a lot of foreign, you know, SAS units. And uh, they're all great. They all have yeah. different specialties. And, uh, you know, I've always thought of myself as not so much a medic. And, and I think most PJs kind of feel this, though they're uh, nationally certified, registered nationally paramedics. Um, that's only one aspect of it. It really is. I've always thought of myself as a rescue expert. You know, that's that's what I was always told my job was. Uh, like you said, my job was to be able at a moment's notice to go anywhere uh, at any time around the world and execute a rescue. We don't know what it's going to be. Uh, you know, I always like to say, you know, we're bad weather animals, disasters fair as children. You know, when people are running away from the chaos or Cobar Towers, they're coming out, we're going in, you know, like any of our, our, our forces who are rescue folks and who are medics. But I've always enjoyed the complexity of the rescue. So some some guys enjoy the medicine. Some yeah. guys enjoy the shooting. Some enjoy the uh, the climbing. Some enjoy the jumping, the free fall and all that stuff. All great. Um, but it was to me it's about solving the puzzle like how are we going to execute this rescue uh you know what's the crux in there what are we really dealing with obviously you know once you get in there because before you even get to you know the downed helo or a cobar towers you know before you can get in there and put your hands on patients you know we still gotta we gotta worry about safety how are we going to get in there are we climbing in are we moving slabs of rock so yeah, so if you if you got to be able to execute that anytime, anywhere around the world, then you spend a lot of time training and going to schools um, that are, um, you know, shoring up those areas that you need, the expertise you need to have to execute a rescue. Yeah, your training and expertise really allows you guys to be attached or embedded with a lot of sister forces and doing some pretty high intense missions, you know, that perhaps you wouldn't ever think of. You know, like you said, it, there are roles for every branch and there are, are roles of what everybody does within a branch. And I think, you know, there are complementary um, opportunities where there may be a specific uh, mission where a PJ would complement whatever force is going for it, you know, yeah. to hit the X. And yep. you guys may be pulled in and maybe the only Air Force guy, 
you know, type of thing. And I think that's a lot, what's a lot of uh, maybe uh, confusing to a lot of people who are not aware of that um, and maybe are looking at entering the service is that, you know, PJs end up going all over the place. And, and like you said, working with SAS, working with SF, working with Delta, working with whomever, you know. Yeah. And, yeah, that's why I would, that's why uh, I really enjoyed being a PJ. And when I when when you guys say it now and I look back at the life of, you know, a 26 year career and most of that in pararescue, uh, that's what made it fun. You know, I I like to move around and um, and work with different people, you know, and different teams and stuff like that. So uh, that was a lot of the reward and the, and the experiences you gain from moving around from different teams, you know, and seeing how these guys do it. And uh, and you and you and you take those lessons learned and you move right on to the next team. You can really garner a lot of life experience from from training with some of the highest most respected soft units on the planet um you know and just getting attached to them and, and that's what was really it's it's really neat and you know the for pararescue um you know that's their primary job you know within the dod that that's not a tertiary mission now everybody within the dod all your services and, and i can't speak to how scott does it over there with the sas but within within uh, you know, with our within our country, all the respective services have an obligation to to do self SAR and and police their own and do the best they can for their own. Um, that's a tertiary mission. That's a secondary mission. You know, the Rangers have a secondary mission for 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 rescue, but that's a primary mission. It's the DOD's primary mission for Air Force pararescue. That's their only job. They come in and sign up for. That's what they do on a day to day, and that's when they go down range and execute their job. That's what they do. That's their primary mission. It's not a secondary or tertiary. It's their primary. So, um, yeah. Yeah. I'm assuming that like a lot of special operations in the op tempo and, and what you guys have in terms of, you know, experiences, um, I think one of our biggest challenges that we're seeing within the veteran community, especially within the soft community, is post-traumatic stress and, you know, the issues related to that. Do you know how is it affected within your 26-year uh, career? How How did it really affect you? Um, and the people around you and stuff and those that you served and, and is it one of those things that, you know, um, well, I know that we're really trying to face it and to tackle the issues and stuff that go along with that, but in, in what ways has it really affected you or you've been able to maybe even aid others, um, you know, going through those experiences? Yeah. So yeah, I'll, I'll share a story with you. Um, you know, because I, I still remember exactly where this this was brought up to me because in some ways I guess I was was ignorant to the fact that when you when you talk about operators at the highest level, you know, the tip of the spear type of folks, it's a volunteer job. They're indoctrinated a certain way. Many of these guys, they've been thinking about it since high school. They they want to join this community. So I actually thought that when you talk about, and I never called it PTSD, but when you talk about combat stress, yeah, I'm, I'm not saying that I thought that we were entirely immune from it. I just didn't think um, that that it was rampant as it was in our communities, you know, because because of all the training, because mm -hmm. it was a volunteer job. And if that makes sense. Oh, yeah. So so our guys know what they're getting into. You know, the guys, they graduate school. They know that, hey, within two weeks, they're going to be on the front lines. Or they're going to be deploying. So you take a person who hasn't had the training we have, and now they're getting tasked to go outside the wire. And they're 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 doing convoys as they're doing transfers between fobs. They're getting hit by IEDs, and now they're picking up weapons. Well, they haven't had all the training I've had. So in, in some ways, I, I was ignorant to the fact that our guys were actually being affected by it. So in yeah. 2000, in 2007, yeah, 2007, I had a guy who was was a PJ, a really good pararescue man. He was involved in a helicopter crash, and it was a, it was a, uh, it was a 47, and he was sitting in the middle, and everybody after him, I believe it was everybody after, and I might get this confused or I might get this messed up, but. Uh, everybody after him died and everybody forward to him lived. Okay. And he was a critical guy. 
Okay, so he was one of the more critical guys, kind of right there on the cusp of, of being really, really serious. So he spent some time in the hospital. So within about a year, he got out and got back up on the teams. Okay, so now this guy's working for me and um, ready to go back down, uh, back in combat. He's ready to deploy and he's doing the pre spin up, you know, the, uh, during the uh, pre spin up training. And he's in charge. He's the team leader. He's a team leader, a good pair of rescue men getting ready to take this team down range. And we're like, I think we were eight days from taking the team down range. And he walks into my office and he goes, and he shuts the door. He goes, NG. So NG is my combat, combat initials. I know you guys have your combat initials, November golf. He goes, November golf. Can I talk to you? I go, yeah, what's up? He goes, um, yeah, I can't take the team down range. And I go, what do you mean? You can't take the team down range. Like you've been with them for those last three months, training them up. You're deploying in eight days. And he goes, um, yeah, I, I just can't go. And I'm, and I'm kind of like, what do you mean you can't go? And he goes, something's wrong. And I go, you mean something's wrong in your head? He goes, yeah, something's going on. I can't take the guys down range. And he was really nice about it. And I go, okay, yeah, don't worry about it. We'll find somebody to replace you. But that was the first time that I actually heard, that's the year it happened. That's the first time I heard of anybody talking about what I'll call combat stress and pararescue. Never. Yeah. That's, that's the first time anybody ever mentioned anything like that. It wasn't unless it wasn't on my radar. But and this you see how it went down in that office. It wasn't on my radar. So I sent an email up to our chiefs and I said, hey, uh, maybe we want to canvas the force. I just had a guy come in and say he's having some emotional problems. And he goes, oh, OK, really? So they sent out an email and sure enough, we got these little onesies and twosies back from a lot of the different squadrons. And that's when we realized that, um, hey, we're starting to have now look at where we were. You know, we're, we're seven years in the war. You know, we're in right. um, um, and we're at a pretty high ops tempo. You know, it's not it's not uh, a quick in and out. It's a stained war now. It's a stain at war. Um, but that's that's when I first first noticed it. And and since then, we've moved light years from then. OK, now we have huge uh, initiatives called uh, preservation of the force and family that's right smack within aspect war or guardian angel or battlefield airmen. So the Air Force as a whole has come full circle on from that time all the way up to a huge initiative called preservation of the force and family, which is taking care of our of our operators mentally you know it's got di different pillars that reside within you know spiritual you know social work the physical and mental to help out with the physical and mental stressors of war you know and yeah. uh that's one of the reasons why i asked that because i know that you guys are really at the tip of the spear of that in terms of a lot of different career fields you know you guys have really embraced that your leadership and have created uh, a lot of different programs. And, and I'm familiar with some of them, like you had just mentioned, especially within like the San, uh, San Antonio area and, and uh, what they're doing there in the commands. Very commendable. And I think it is an area of focus. Um, but we, we also see it, of course, with those who are in the veteran community who are former PJs, who may at that time frame again, because of the op tempo, what they were doing and everything else, it didn't seem like it affected them because they were in the mission. They were in the fight. That's right. They, they come back home. They have an opportunity to transition. They're not around those teammates. They're not in the fight. And then that's when, you know, those things uh, of the past and what they saw or experienced or whatever starts creeping up. And, and those are the things that we really have to watch within the community. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And, you know, it's, um, you know, they, I, I think the military has done, at least for, from my vantage, from where I sent and coming from AFSPEC or the AFSPEC war community within the Air Force, they've done a phenomenal job um, at, at trying to implement the processes and the initiatives um, at the pace that is, is commensurate with how the Air Force and the DOD moves out they've done they've done a they've done a great job uh it continues to get better they continue to put these things in place that that make our family stronger um and based off the lessons they've learned and it's it, it's not a fault of the military it, it's just how it is you know you know nobody expected 9 11 to happen boom we're right smack in the middle of it and um and some lessons we probably we 
continue to learn again, you know, things from, from Vietnam and, and, and our world wars. But um, from, from at least where I sat and what I saw, they, they tried to make the initiatives and put the things in place, the mechanisms that um, were that did the best by the men, by the operators, um, as we started to hit those tipping points and, yeah. and, 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 and started to understand them. I like what you're saying there because, you know, there is a period of, you know, you got to evolve. And, yep. and like you said, um, you mentioned Vietnam, you mentioned, you know, even previous wars and stuff. When you look at those, you know, we didn't know what to term it. We didn't know what to call it. We didn't really, you know, shell shock. It was yeah. combat fatigue. It was, you know, other terms that you didn't really know how to fix. And you thought that it was isolated cases, not realizing that it could be systemic within certain MOSs, you know, and, and challenged because of the op tempo and the things that we're requiring of our forces. So I think there is a bit um, of evolving that has taken place through the war and learning we have to be able, you know, we learn on the battlefield of, of medicine and techniques and everything to save lives. And the same thing is applicable as we begin to grow in, in the service of understanding post-traumatic stress, traumatic brain injury, how to recognize those things, identify them early, you know, maybe put them on the bench, but not take them out of the fight necessarily. You know, we're back as back in the day, it was an automatic discharge today. They're yeah. at least work, trying to find opportunities to salvage um, a service member who they spent a tremendous amount of money and training on and, and see if there's an opportunity where they can keep them engaged, but while also trying to help them, you know, get fixed and, and their family along with that. So I, I think we're making um, better stride. We have a better, we're, we're at a better pace now um, yeah. than what we were in the past. I would agree with you with a, a lot of different commands. We still have a ways to go, Yeah, but there's a lot of unknown here. As yep. we begin to navigate through it. Yeah, these, you know, for the most part, you know, when you think about war, these are uncharted, you know, waters, okay, mm -hmm. you know, um, and, and, and look at all the technology and the advancements and medicine and everything and, and prosthetics and everything that comes out of it's unfortunate, but it's a byproduct of, of war. But look at everything it drives, you know, all these type of things and, yep. and uh, you know, but um, yeah, I, I, I think they've, I think, uh, They've done very well, you know, and 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 try to capitalize on some of those things to to take care of, better care of our families and support them. And I and they're and they're and they're going to continue to get better. I don't see them going backwards. You know, that's what I want to believe. But I don't see them them going backwards in this initiative when it comes to taking better care of our families from from cradle to grave. You know, because what good is to invest in the operator? And yeah, he does that, and he and he does twenty, thirty years, and and our veterans who who give, um, you know, uh, they're, they're all to, to go and, and execute war and, and then to be, to be at the most critical juncture as they separate from the military and, and to be broken and to, to be broken after that. So, um, you know, what I think what a lot of people don't understand is there's a lot of knowledge out there. There's a lot of best, there's a lot of best practices on how to do this better, but when it comes to the human mind and the psyche, it doesn't have to be perfect. We don't have to have per perfect mechanisms. The theme is perfect, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. And if you're trying to do right by the people and take good care of them, that part w will resonate and help keep them stronger as they as they do their time in the military and separate after them after that, if that makes sense. Yeah. I think the military has evolved more in this last era than it has in you know, you spoke about the, the Vietnam conflict, the Second World War, the First World War. I mean, in the UK, we had the, the Northern Ireland conflict, the Falklands War in the early 80s. But the the Iraq-Afghanistan period or the, the global war on terror, the, the military as a whole has evolved more in the last 20 years than it ever has, I think, in, in its its entire life cycle, you know. And it's, it's, it's definitely moving forward in, in terms of, acceptance and losing stigma you know and you spoke earlier tony about you know as a, a an operator not thinking that it could affect you guys because of all the training you have and the understanding the knowledge the expectation of seeing and doing those things but everybody's human at the end of the day and everybody's got a you know a, a certain volume that your your your, your cap can hold 
uh, yeah. as one of the common al- uh, analogies is. So everybody's got a breaking point and, and a point where they, they they just can't absorb anymore and take anymore on board. And I think the military deals with it a lot better now. And Robert said earlier, you know, previously, if you, if you said, listen, I'm not feeling right, that was it. You was gone. Yeah. Literally, yeah. okay, you're no good to us anymore. Out the door. And I think now they they deal with it better. But again, Robert said the the words that I think are right equally. There's a long way to go still, you know. Yep. And there's there's a huge amount of talent and experience and skill in people. And if if they're suffering from whatever it may be in terms of uh, stress related, then you know the, the, there's no benefit to anybody in in releasing them. Because that you know the, that person loses that sense of purpose, that sense of belonging, those things that can help you, um, you know, recover effectively uh, before you get released back out. And um, I, I think you know that the, there's a huge amount that's being done now that was never even thought of, you know, in, in previous eras or generations, if you like, of uh, uh, of military or combat um, uh, veterans, yeah. I guess. Yeah. No, you're absolutely right. If you if you think about it in the sense of, you know, um, maybe this is analogous to if you think about at least within the air in the Air Force, you know, and then you guys can, I'm sure, could tie it to something from your respective uh, branches. But in the Air Force, you know, you have the, you have the aircraft and everything's built around the aircraft. You know, it really is. It's built around the, you know. The F thirty, you know, the F thirty five, the F twenty two, that it's sixteens, and and they're built around that, and the whole base is kind of built around in support of of the aircraft, the maintenance and everything like that, and uh, it, it's kind of neat because you know early on in my career I was dating this girl who worked in an area called NDI, and that was the lab, that was the lab techs that analyzed the oil hmm. of the aircraft. And I'm like, so what do you do? And she's like, well, you know, like she goes, we could tell what's breaking down before it ever breaks down in the aircraft just by analyzing and doing these hard metal checks within the oil. And they 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 run everything through the labs and everything. And and so they keep these aircraft in top maintenance, you know, these in 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 the best performance they possibly could be. And before the engine breaks down, or and they could tell everything about it before it breaks down. They're constantly doing that. That's the way. You need to you need to build the infrastructure around your people that you built around the airframe. At least if like you that. if if that makes sense. No, okay? it does. So, so you you got to put you got to put and it's got to start early on. It can't yeah. start halfway through their careers. It's from day one. You have the infrastructure in place. You you have resiliency programs. You you're tighter on your networking and stuff like that. Uh, you know it goes back to kind of what I was saying about hey it doesn't have to be perfect, but if the people understand that. You're trying to get to perfect, or we're trying to make the best programs we possibly. That's still going to help them psychologically deal with things. And uh, so, you know, that that's the way I look at it. If you're going to build, you have that around the airframes. You know, let's build it around the people the whole time while they're in the military. I, I would say that's a that's a that's a great suggestion. And I think part of the challenge is going to be, and I think you would agree, Tony, is that. Um, you know, we have tons of data that's probably available on aircraft because it was a single focused and so yeah. important to the mission set that we failed to see the thing that's most you know obvious in front of us, which is the human capital side of this thing. So now we're we're making a pivot. We're doing a course correction and trying to capture data as quickly as we can to be able to combat and see leading indicators to how we can address the issues we're seeing with post-traumatic stress and right. traumatic brain injury. It's going to take a period of time. People want more now, but I really believe we're trying to make, you know, a, a strong effort to evolve and understand that. But it means we also have to collect data and yep. it means people have to be willing to come forward so that the data can then be put within some place to be analyzed. And That's right. To identify those leading indicators. So you think yeah. about it, not very many people, we were talking, you know, Scott brought up the stigma, not yeah. very many people up until recently ever wanted to go to command and say that they had, you know, an issue with post-traumatic stress or combat fatigue or whatever, because that was it. Yeah. So if you're talking about a short window where, where we've really probably started learning, you know. And, and that's kind of the difference. Now, I will say this, though, you know, since Scott's on the uh, podcast, is that 
the difference of where we are today here in America to where you are in, you know, Scott with the British forces is like night and day. I mean, it's only been with what the last year or so you've even created a program very similar to the U.S. And I mean, you're almost in, in some phases, and we've talked about this in previous episodes, similar to, you know, not much beyond where we were after post Vietnam. Yeah. I think I'm, the, the, the difficult thing, thing for me to to comprehend with this is we, we fight in the same conflict. You know, in, it, it's, it's not as if we're involved in a set of conflicts and you're involved in a set of conflicts and we're completely separate entities in different parts of the world. We, we serve together. We, we, you know, you do joint operations, mixed missions. It's, it's, it's a combined force you know with and more than just the british and the american but individually back in their home countries then there there isn't the same um grounding there isn't the same understanding there isn't the same availability of things you know and, and this is right the way up from uh, ptsd or um post traumatic care uh, or uh, recovery programs you know we, we was talking on the podcast two weeks ago i think it was with um when nick goldsmith was on the the former royal marine um uh, uh, about an operation that's available in the u.s and you know nick had never heard of that and nick was has been diagnosed with complex ptsd and the the benefits of that operation would probably greatly improve nick's life and it benefit him and his family immensely but it, it's not you know it's not heard of it's not the general practice over here but it's it's becoming more and more available within the u.s and you know e- even down to equipment I, I remember going to afghanistan uh in 2002 and we we literally deployed in january with um winter equipment for for uh, for basically the likes of norway and things and nothing else and we we got to we got to me and the temperature swung completely over about three weeks and we was literally i, I was in gore-tex line boots you know <laughs> uh, and and winter thermal socks <laughs> a sleeping bag i took with me was you know a, a comfort rating of minus 12 <laughs> and it was just we, we didn't that was we didn't have any decent equipment you know we was we was in a desert environment in in dpm temperate um e- equipment you know there, there was just nothing and we cleared um uh, uh, what was a new camp for the americans next door to where we was um for for you guys to come in and take that over and I, I remember, and I think I've probably told this story before, Robert. Uh, I, I remember the, the Americans coming on the handover day, and my team had cleared this um, this old barracks, and all these Humvees coming down the road, you know, and, and the guys are on the top on the 50 cal in, you know, uh, American football jerseys with their uh, um, body armor over the top of it. And I just thought, that, you know, this, this is like an, a movie with the way you see Americans portrayed in the movie. But when the guys turned up then and, and, you know, he's talking and just having a conversation and, and take my job is to take the guys through and say, right, we've cleared all these rooms and go in and show them everything. And, you know, we was just having a general conversation and we was talking about equipment and things. And we was like, we don't get any of that shit. Well, what's, what's going on here that we we're in exactly the same conflict. We, you know, we, we're now, neighbors effectively in in our compound was next door to this new compound that we cleared for you guys and you know just basic things like i hadn't I hadn't seen a you know a a, a a can of coke in probably three months and the guys are turning up with great big slabs of pepsi and <laughs> snacks and things and it was just like the, the difference between two militaries and i think it's mm-hmm. there's always been that gap you know, in terms of services, equipment, from the very basic stuff, the trivial things, right the way up to the important things. Uh, and, you know, I think budget comes down to a lot of it in terms oh, yeah. of budget is phenomenal compared to, to ours in, in, in the UK. And, you know, it 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 shouldn't be that way in terms of 
us having to think of you know or set up our own programs that are expensive uh, you know resource heavy because you guys have already done that and you've got the budget to do that you know that the, for me there the should be joint services and and combined uh, and supporting each other and you know budget sharing almost and, and getting our guys on your programs or th- there's no point in reinventing the wheel i think is the the common phrase robert and i often talk about and i just think there's a huge amount that you know we, we could learn likewise uh, with with sharing and i, I know there's a lot that goes on in um british with, with you guys over there and you guys over here as you said earlier tony you was you were yeah. stationing in you know, uh, but I, th- I think there's there's more opportunity for collaboration, particularly around the back end of things. You know, the the post service um, care treatment. You know, just your GI bill compared. We don't have anything like that in in the UK. You know, yeah. so it's it's the, 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 there's there's a huge amount of opportunity I think for for collaboration and you know cross pollination of learning I guess. Um, between the, uh, our two countries. And it's just a shame that it doesn't happen. It doesn't yeah. get done. Well, one of the areas I think where you guys yeah. also fall sh- you know, short or at least have a difficult time is something where Tony has actually um, created you know, Fusion Cell that is around helping transition military service members. And we, we talk a lot about the challenges of making the transition and trying to find employment, trying to find your passion and your purpose. And it's equally as difficult for those service members that are over in the UK, you know, that are trying to do that same thing, or for that matter, other countries. And, um, you know, one of the things that you guys are doing there, Tony, is, is really trying to help these individuals find their, their new home, their new, their new place. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so just to give you some, you know, background on that, it, it's because so uh, um, I, I, I separated, let's, let's just say I separated from the Air Force on Friday. Well, on Monday, I started, uh, I, I was lucky and fortunate enough to be in a position or an opportunity to to buy a business. And so I bought a company called SEI. And I started running that thing on Monday after I separated on, on Friday. And uh, so I continued to, to stay plugged into to the AFSPEC war community and kind of the soft community um, by training those guys through SEI. And then a year later, um, a buddy of mine that I spent some time at one of the units, we started up. Uh, he wanted to start up something to help address uh, combat stress, PTSD for PJs. Uh, combat rescue officers. So we started up the Pararescue Foundation. Okay. So because of those ties, and I see the community a lot uh, through the Pararescue Foundation or through SEI, where they'll come up for regular training, I started getting all these phone calls from guys who were getting ready to get out. You know, they're they're a year from getting out. And then some guys called me up, said, hey, I need to, I want to find a job. What's out there? I'm like, well, when are you getting out? They're like, well, I got out Friday, you know? And, and so I was basically doing what probably predecessors before me were doing and other guys that were in the operator world. I was pushing them back overseas to do contracting stuff because that's where a lot of our guys. That's where they're comfortable too. That's where they're comfortable. And they have, we had a lot of network there. The money, the money was good. And so, you know, so a lot of these guys were like, Hey, I'm not sure what I want to do. And I'm like, okay, Hey, call this guy. They're looking for, they're looking for PJs. They're looking for SEALs. They're looking for guys. Um, and you know, see how that works out. Well, I had five good friends of mine either get hurt, maimed or killed. Okay. And then the last, the icing on the cake was a good buddy of mine. Once I moved up here to New Hampshire, you know, I ran into an old, uh, you know, seal buddy of mine. I said, Hey, what do you think about coming out doing some work with, uh, with SEI and the company said, yeah, absolutely. I got to go do a contracting gig. And he went and, uh, basically got his legs blown off. So, When that happened, it got me thinking about like, you know what, why don't we try to offer some different opportunities to our, our, our guys who are getting out. Okay. Because some of them, no matter what, they're probably always good. They're, they're going to want to be gunslingers, no matter how, you know, they're just cut that way. And no matter, you know, how long they stay in, even if they were older, that's what they want to go do. Yeah. But I don't think that's the norm for everybody. Mostly, if you if you have a traditional life, you have some kids, you get older, you make your way from the terminal area up to the, you know, you're doing time at the Pentagon, you become a chief, you become a sergeant major and you have family. And and so 
you know, you, 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 you graduate up to the strategic positions and maybe you don't want to go back into that. But what you'd like to do is you'd like to find a comparable um, job that is commensurate with the strategic job you've been doing maybe at the Pentagon or some of the higher ranks of being, you know, a master chief, a, a sergeant major, um, a chief master sergeant in the Air Force or, or an officer. And so, uh, so I wanted to, I wanted to start leverage in my business connections. So I ran into a guy up here. Uh, there was a iHeart Radio talk show host by the name of Jack Heath, mm-hmm. and he was a real prolific, and he is a very prolific guy up here for helping veterans. And so all these folks kept saying, "Hey, you should go go talk to Jack. Go talk to Jack. You know, very well connected, nice guy, and just done a lot for veterans." So him and I got together and we said, "Hey, you know, why don't we just start here in New England?" And we'll just uh, we'll come talk to some of these companies and see if they're if they'd be willing to. Uh, I know it's like grassroots. It's like you walk in there, like, hey, would you be willing to hire qualified veterans? Oh yeah, I'd be willing to hire qualified veterans. I mean, if you could show me a qualified veteran and you get an yeah. application, what does that look like? Yeah, yeah, what, you know, and absolutely. So that that was the startup of really a fusion cell, and then. Um, and when you when you think about only having so much capacity, I mean, look at what you guys do. You know, you guys are busy and you only have so much time in a day and and you're trying to cover down on the things you can cover down on. Well, initially, I was looking at it just for, you know, taking care of like my community and some of the operators and, and trying to find some of these guys um, jobs out there as, as as what I didn't know. Program managers, you know. Tiger team stuff, but you know, maybe that's a program manager, a, a, a business development guy. And uh, so as we start sitting down with different companies, you know, all of them are, you know, and who's going to say otherwise? It's not like somebody's going to come out and say, well, no, I don't want to hire a veteran. I absolutely want to hire veterans. You give me a qualified veteran, Tony, and I'll hire him as long as I have a job opening and I understand what he does and we can see how we can we see how to make him fit into uh, the company, you know, if I go down to Wayfair and we talk to them, you know, I even, I joke around about it, but, uh, you know, we chatted with a couple of companies and I remember the guy going, well, Tone, you know, I don't know, you know, I, it's not like I need a seal to take the building down. I go, yeah, you don't, but you know what? Um, you probably could use him as somebody to lead teams, you know, to, to, to drive, to drive other components or cells of the organization. We can, we can, we can find out where to put them and stuff like that. So, um, so eventually fusion cell has grown into, um, a company where we have an investor now and, and, and it's, it's, it's growing to a level where we're taking on, we have clients and then we have, uh, veterans who are obviously getting out every single day looking for jobs. Um, and we take them on and we have clients who are, who are, um, wanting us to help them find these these qualified veterans that we said we could find them and th- and that's what we're doing so that's what fusion cell is but where i was going to say from a capacity where it grew outside of just helping operators and it and it grew into helping all veterans all rates mos's and afscs is because when i'm sitting down with with these different companies they're like well yeah i could use some of those guys but you know right now i have 200 openings right now on the floor or I, I got 300 openings for, you know, I need a, I need a logistician. I need 10 ITs. I need business development people. And so that's where it kind of opened my eyes into like, okay, well, there, there's, there's a lot more jobs out there. We're going to have to open up the aperture here. So that's, that's your MOSs. That's your different services. So we, it, it opened up to uh, increase the pool of all for all veterans. I think the challenge that I've seen, you know, in my time within the private sector is educating, um, educating the private sector on what veteran, you know, what a veteran can offer to them, not just in soft skills. I'm talking about even hard skills. You know, there's a lot of different um, MOSs that that really are preparing them to transition very easily into the private sector if a company can actually see those benefits, see the value that they're going to provide the organization along with the soft skills and had those two individuals that one that went out to the private sector initially out of, let's say college or whatever, um, or trade school. And that, that person that came from the military, if you follow them along the same path and journey, you're probably going to find that the individual that was in the military carries more soft skill benefits than the individual that didn't. 
and yet they're often overlooked or they're only seen for the soft skills. They're not really seen for the other value that they bring to the table. Um, and so it's really a process, too, of educating the private sector that, oh, they're not just for entry level roles. You know, you could get mid and senior level positions that are not just officers, but enlisted individuals who may bring an MBA to the table, may bring a wealth of knowledge of how, like you said, to build teams, drive the strategy, you know, and, and develop a plan and an execution to get it accomplished, hold their people accountable, apply metrics to everything that they do. You know, it's not a mindset necessarily um, that we see within the private sector all the time, especially at the same age group. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So, so here, so I'm just going to share my philosophy on this because this is, this is where I want fusion cell. This is what I want fusion cell to grow into because this is absolutely what you said is, is so bewildering to me. You know, when, when I went to go get out, if technically, if you think about it and Scott, I don't know how it is with you and how it works over there, but, uh, you know, uh, when you go to get out of, you know, the air force, you know, my AFSC or my MOS or my rate, you know, you can put that into a little gonculator and it basically tells you what you would qualify for in the civilian sector. And uh, but it doesn't take into account all that other stuff you talked about, yeah. like your worldly, your worldly experience, your soft skills. It doesn't take into account that, hey, though he was a PJ, you know, I served at the highest levels of, of strategy and strategic type of stuff that it doesn't take into that. Um, so it's, it's hard to believe, like if you take somebody who's been in the civilian, the civilian corporate world and they go from, they make their way up through Wayfair and they become a middle manager or, or a, maybe even a senior leader from Wayfair, they can kick over to Google. And then after that, they can go to BAE and, and everybody yep. understands how that looks, but, but you can be an institutionalized officer enlisted in the military and then when you go to get out there's this huge gap yeah you got to translate huge, all that yeah. that's right and it's really it's really hard to believe so the way i look at this is it's hard to believe that as long as the military's been around and as long as the civilian components that have been around and we could start with the civilian companies that support the military all your big huge companies we could start there and we could take this all the way across to the workforce but the fact that we've been around and we've had our military this long and they haven't come up with and, and looked at it like, let's form a relationship here, almost like a pipeline. But it's a, a two-way street, though, because you yeah. remember there's an us and them mentality on both sides of the fence. Yeah. You know, I see it at least. I see, you know, a lot of people within the civilian community don't understand why it is that you joined uh, the military, what it is that you truly did. I mean, they think you're putting bullets down range, you, you know, that's all you're doing. Yeah. Um, they don't understand what you bring to the table. It's yeah. hard for you to articulate that back because it's not the lingo that you speak. Whereas that other individual who's your yeah. peer in terms of yeah. um, education, uh, education experience can articulate it. Like you said, yeah. they know how to sell it. They know yeah. how to package it. It's that it's that yeah. skill gap that we're talking about, uh, educational gap. No, you're right, Robert, and and that's where I was talking about. So so look at it like this. Um, it's because nobody's really taking the time to do it. Yes, that's but it's, correct. But, it, but it's a missed opportunity. It's a missed opportunity on both parts. It's a missed opportunity on the DOD's part. Totally and it's, agree. A missed, it, it's a missed opportunity on the civilian sector's part. If you think about it this way, if we take a ladder, so just picture a ladder in your head. Just a ladder with rungs, okay? And on one side of the ladder, you have the, and, and not just the Air Force, you have all the military branches, okay? And from the bottom of that ladder all the way to the top, you look at that like, look at it from one year to 30 years, and you have all your different jobs, and that's your military side over there, okay? And then you take those rungs, those, those rungs of that ladder are the offshoots of where People would be ex ex exiting the military. And you know how it works. For the most part, you're getting out at four year. You do a four-year enlistment. You can do an eight-year. You can do a 10. All the way up to 30 years approximately, okay? And then outside of those rungs, people can still offshoot at different points, but they offshoot for, you know, I had a discharge, honorable discharge, dishonorable discharge. I had a medical disability. But for the most part, everybody kind of knows 
what these people are and where they can get off. And the yeah. other side, and the other side is is corporate or the civilian workforce, okay, that's on the other side. And say it's a big company like um what what's like BAE or something like that, okay? Or some big company. Well, that company can be strung out all the way all from top to bottom down that other side of the ladder. Why? Because they need entry level people way down here at the bottom. So yep. if you come in for four years, you you offshoot and you could go right into an entry level. Same position. vertical rungs that the you same, were talking about. Same yeah. vertical rung. But at the top, yeah. say you became a colonel or a general or a, a sergeant major or a master chief, and you did 28 years. You you offshoot way at the top here, you know, and it and, and the reason why it needs to be a joint thing, because if you if you team these two up together. All your HR departments know exactly what they're getting because they've been fused. So they kind of know, hey, look at that AFSC, that MOS or that rate. We understand that. Matter of fact, we hire. This is the rate or the MOS that we want to target for our for our company. And so does that make sense? You have this yeah. company on the left side. You have all the different jobs and they're and they're fused and they're and they're fed into each. Other. It's it's you could almost look at it this way. You could almost know what job you're going to have before you enter the military and sign up to be an intel officer. You come in as an intel officer. You say, I'm going to do eight years. Well, I already know that if I offshoot at an eight-year or 10-year rung, that I'm eligible for these hundred companies. They've, they've been fused, and they've been working with the military a long time. They hire. If you do 30 years, you're kind of on a track over here. So instead of looking at this military as like, hey, those guys go off and serve. They do this thing. They took this route of – the military, what is that? You look at it like that's a pipeline. It's a pipeline that feeds our country mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and the civilian workforce. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. And it's a, it's a I, challenge that Scott feel, uh, I, I can feel your pain already um, through Scott, this whole thing. Scott, yeah. tell me, am I, am I off base on this? I, th I, th I think you, you, you're 100% on point with it, Tony. But I think, I think that exists yeah. in certain companies. It, and they, and they don't want to share that with anybody because they cream in all the talent off. They got the pick of the people coming out of the military and people like people like Amazon can relate military yeah. jobs to Amazonian jobs. Yeah. And they know that. So the, the companies, KPMG, Deloitte, Amazon, the, the big companies or the companies with big military recruitment programs, they know what's going on and they know that translation piece. And that word, and Robert said earlier, and we, 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 we speak about it regularly, translation is the key to it. It's, it's, it's two languages, isn't it? Yeah. The military is yeah. a language from one country, and you're emigrating, you know, you're returning essentially back to civilian street, and you're moving from one country to another, and they speak different languages, and you've got you've to pick up the new lingo now to, to fit in. But I think some of these big companies, they can do that for you. And they can say, well, listen, I suggest this role. You come in as a team leader, come in as an area manager, come in as an ops manager, senior ops manager, program manager. That's the job for you. Come and have the interview with us. And, and they'll, they'll walk you through which job they think you're going to be good at. The yeah. interview process for military people is flexible and robust enough that you do really well in the interview, actually, Let's go to the job above. You don't do so well. Maybe let's go to the job below. Give him twelve months in that, and then move him uh, into the original job that we thought. But they know roughly where you're going to go. But they're not going to share that with people because they're going to lose that talent pool then. Because everybody's going to know. So you, you know, all all these logisticians coming out of the military, huge numbers of people yeah. with logistics experience. The the world revolves around logistics. You know, the the biggest company in the world. Is, is essentially a logistics company, yeah. you know, and, and if all these other companies know it, all that talent is going to be spread amongst all the different companies. Now, that's beneficial for everybody leaving the military. It's not so beneficial for the people who want the cream uh, off the top. And the only way to get that then is financially, isn't it? Yeah. You've got to offer yeah. an extra buck, an extra two bucks, an extra 10 bucks an hour, whatever it might be package wise in in senior roles so that that's kind of a, a closely guarded secret for for the companies that do it well and we all know the companies that do it well but the the military is not bothered in doing that 
Thanks very much. I've you know I've I've had my eight years from you. I've had my twenty years from you. I've had my thirty-two years out of you. Thanks very much. Thanks thank thanks for all you've done. Out you go into the big wide world, and they're not interested in helping with that piece. I don't think. But the 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 solution that you just said, Tony, is perfect. You know, and 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 that example of the ladder with you know military on the left and civilian. Uh, careers on the right and and the vertical rungs are mapped out is, is a perfect solution but i don't i just don't think you'd get buy in from either side because one set of people want to keep it to themselves and the other people aren't really invested in it it, it, it doesn't give enough reward for them because it's dead money effectively dead resource isn't it because it's going for people leaving so it's it it, it is the perfect solution it just would take a hell of a lot of buy in from both sides to, to get them both to commit to it, you know, on a widespread uh, point. I'm going to say something that's probably not going to be um, liked too much, but I can see on both sides of it, you've got a transition assistance program that's focused on incenting uh, or incentivizing um, uh, an organization based on how many people attend a mandatory class before they separate. So it's, it's mandatory. They have to come, yeah. but they may get measured on how many people come, not how many jobs they fill. On the opposite side of it, you've got the private sector, to your point, that are creating military-friendly um, programs to attract or at least get the soft skills and people that they can put at very entry-level types of roles or a little above an entry level. They benefit because they get an outstanding person with traits and qualities and characteristics that they absolutely want and value as their human capital within their organization. But they don't want to take the time, and I'm calling you out, you don't want to take the time to look at the military skills well enough to see along that rung if there is equal play there because they don't feel that you paid your dues in the military in the private sector, just like the military wouldn't accept, accept somebody who spent eight years in the private sector and they now should come in other than the medical field. They now should come in as a, as a captain, you know, in the, uh, the military. Hey, I was a, a director level VP level individual in the private sector. I should be a Lieutenant Colonel or, uh, you know, um, you know, a major, uh, yeah. within the military. So I, I'm just kind of trying to play the devil's advocate here that what we've created is um, a program where we're trying to play nicely and we're trying to help a transition. Um, and we do that through a, either a transition program as you're getting out, or we do that through uh, military friendly companies um, that that's what they call themselves, you know, which, yeah. which really they place positions out there that they want to, that they're not going to see you as an equal person. But they're friendly. They're yeah. military friendly. It's not a bad thing either way. Yeah. It's just we have to understand some of the landscape that we're in. Yeah, The systems don't talk to each other equally, no. though, do they? So no, but there is a book in, or, or a program, an application that does do what you're talking about, Anthony, because it does say these are the jobs, like you said, based on your experience and what you've done. It doesn't take the human factor into that. No. That is kind yeah. of what's missing on the on the private sector side. But yeah. yet they're That's not going to see. That's hard coded, though, isn't it? That's it like is. for like. It is. You, yeah. you're, 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 you're we have, in, we have artificial UK, intelligence those... now. We should be able to yeah. figure this out. But it, you know? it, 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 it needs yeah, a little yeah. bit of the human touch to to understand. You know what 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 did you do in your time? Because whilst I might have been, you know, a, a royal engineer and an electrical engineer, so in, in my job spec, it's going to match me up with either being a a construction person because i've got a combat engineer trade it's either going to see say you've got to be your qualified trade an electrician yeah. or it's going to say work in some kind of ngo role in mine clearance because that's yeah. what your trades are but they're they're the hard i was gonna say that's the that's the that's the blue collar positions but if you're talking yeah. about <laughs> corporate america you know going white collar and stuff it's going to be much harder but if you are yeah. looking to be a police officer and you were security forces there's some like 
you know, combinations there. It's, it's, it's transitional, of course yeah. it is. Yeah, but yeah. What, what I'm talking about in terms of the systems not talking to each other. So in, in the UK, we've got a program called the Career Transition Partnership, which is designed to help people find a job when, when you leave the military. But the metric set up for that organization is the number of people employed within six months of leaving service. Now, it, it, it's a completely wrong metric. Mm -hmm. Well, the metric should be is satisfaction. So yeah. The people employed in a satisfactory role 18 months after the service. Don't forget about the six months. It's too soon. Yeah, you know, that's right. Because yeah. you could put somebody in a job that pays the bills at six months. Yeah. And currently, they're ticking that box and saying, yep, yeah, that person has left. They're taking two months. They're in employment. We've done our part. Job done. But they absolutely hate that job. They've taken it just because it's got to pay the mortgage and you've yeah. got to pay the bills, you know. But actually, I want to do something that's meaningful and I'm going to spend the length of time there. And the problem we get in the UK, and I, 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 I'm willing to bet it's similar in the US, is people leave, they have misconceptions of what they want to do. They think it's a lot easier in civvy street or I can walk into a job because everybody wants to hire veterans. You know, we, we, we've yeah. got so much going for us. Everybody's going to give us a job. And there's many people out there that will and value what we've done in, in our careers. But there's also people that you go to a job interview and there's that doesn't, everything you've wrote in that CV doesn't mean anything to me. I don't know yeah. what that is. I don't, I don't know what you do. Why are you, why are you applying for this job? Because you can't translate what you did into what you're able to do. And yeah. they just they spend three months in the job, end up walking out because they've had an argument with somebody. Screw this job, I'm off. I'm not doing it. And that's where the problems start. Then you've now got no job. You've got no means of paying your bills. You think Civvy Street's a you know a pile of crap, and why why have I left? And all that regret that starts coming out as well. And it's just a downward spiral for people. And I think that satisfaction piece is the most important for people. Yeah. I'm actually doing a job that I enjoy. And yeah. I'm going to have, you know, a length of time doing this because it means something to me now. And I think that's what's missing from, you know, the the, the Department of Defense, the MOD in the UK, helping people to transition. It should be about satisfaction not just a job because it's not long term. It's, it's short term gain, and they're forgetting any, any long term value in it. Does Fusion Cell help all branches? Anybody that comes from anywhere? Absolutely, yeah. It helps uh, all branches. Yep. Okay. And and and, it, and it's not and it's not a transition company. There's that's the thing. You know, that's and you guys have you talk to veterans all the time, so you already know that there's there's plenty of companies that transition the military transition, but you know, at the end of the day, the veteran cares about getting a job, you know, that that's what they want. I don't, I could take transition classes all day, you know, show me this, show me that. And, uh, um, they want a job, you know, uh, or they want to, or they just want to retire, but most of them want to get a job, a secondary job. They're too young. And, and, uh, so, uh, yeah, so it, it's a, it's a, it's not a transition. We've teamed up with some transition companies, companies that, you know, we vetted, you know, the Honor Foundation, you know, it commits another one, great one out there. But, um, you know, and and the thing for a veteran is there's so many, there's so much information. There, there's too much, there's too much out there, you know, hey, which transition place is good? And they're doing this and how many taps? Do I, there's a lot of, there's a lot of that. But uh, no, this, this is a job, this is a job placement company. You know, we, 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 we staff you know, and the other thing I, I didn't bring it up, but I should have brought it up is that um, it's got two components. You know, we hire veterans. So the company hires veterans because we if we hire veterans like they understand veterans. So, you know, I, I'm working there and everybody we've hired has been Air Force. We're bringing on an Army guy. Um, but we've teamed up with, you know, the fourth largest staffing company. Um in the country. So, you know, Medicus, uh, before it was acquired, was the fourth largest staffing company in the com country. So, you know, when I sat down with those guys and we sat with them, myself and Jack Heath, you know, I'm like, well, man, if you're the fourth largest staffing company in the country, you know, you must know something about staffing. Why can't we just staff? We should be able to staff veterans right into um, in, into these companies. So it's a good relationship. You know, now they were staffing what are called local tenants, which are kind of uh, at the medical side, hospital you know, mm. personnel, but mm -hmm. hey, you know what? Now, now we're just taking that and, and uh, we're taking the magic that they understand in staffing and now they're staffing veterans. 
you know. where where can people learn more about fusion cell um you can go to fusioncell.com okay yep and right. are you guys on social media or something like that if they want to follow you on that yeah yeah we're on um you know the fusion cell we have a fusion cell uh website um we're on linkedin we're all over linkedin if you just pop in i mean if you just go to google and pop it fusion cell it's going to be the first thing pop up it'll be the first thing pop popping up and uh um, for all those things you guys said, Scott, you know, and, and, uh, Robert, like, um, this is, this is a, a veteran company. Okay. Um, and going back to all that resiliency, I have a, I have a, 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 a different philosophy on taking care of veterans and it starts from the very beginning. Okay. So like we were talking about, you got to put the resiliency in place. You got to put the infrastructure in place to take care of the veterans because some people get out, some people do four years and they get out. Some do eight, yep. some do 30. I was an institutional some, man. So I do some get medical discharged like tomorrow. Some get medical discharged. Yeah. So, so waiting, waiting for the last year as you're trying to transition and trying to clean up all that mess or the last six months, or even the last two years for somebody who's really self-aware and really thinks they're on their game. I'm telling you, that's not when you do it. Yeah. I I'm telling people right now, you, as soon as you join the military, you sign up with Fusion Cell. What, what are you talking about, Tony? Sign up for Fusion Cell? Yeah. So I can get you with an agent who gets to know you. Well, why would that be important? Because he's going to get to know you and you're going to have a, we'll have a relationship and he'll just check on you. Hey, are you thinking about doing another enlistment? Yeah. Hey, are you thinking about going back to Indiana? Is that really where you want to go? Yeah, I'd like to head back to Indiana because you got to put you got to be strategic about your exit strategy. You got to put time on your side because you know how a lot of these jobs are. It, it's done no differently. And you guys, I'm talking to military guys. Well, to me, this part of corporate and the civilian workforce is done the same way in the civilian sector. A lot of times that it, it's done in the military. I was a chief. I'm strategically moving people around the Air Force. I'm looking out for their careers. If my buddy calls me up and says, hey, I think this would be a, a good guy, let's get him promoted, that's what we're doing. And and you gotta do the same thing out here. You have to be strategic. And so the, the, it, as much lead time as we can we can get on the front side, that allows us, and you know, like, he, like say some young man tells me, hey, I think I wanna go, I wanna go, to Boston, I want to go to Tennessee. Okay, is there a company you're thinking about? Is there some place you want to work down there? Put time, help me put time on my side. Help me set you up for success. Hey, there's three companies down there that I think would be great. When I settle down, I want to go back there. And so these are the things we need to know. And the other thing I will tell you is that the things I'm learning out here when it comes to let say like say some young man tells me some young man or some woman tells me I'm not sure what I want to do, but I want to go back to school. I'm like, okay, might I offer cybersecurity? Oh, well, why cybersecurity? Because you know what? It's not going anywhere. It's a rapidly going, you know, it's it's going to be around a long time. The money is is going to be really good. And go, so since you've contacted me earlier, might I suggest you knock out these five certificates? How, how much time do we have? This one's 13 weeks. This one's eight weeks. Your TA will pay for it. Your GI Bill will cover it. We can probably add another zero because sometimes what I'm learning out here is having certain certificates and qualifications, it's more important than a damn degree. Yes. If that makes sense. Well, what I can't, and it, and it rotates can't do back that at the last forth. minute. That's yeah. right. But we yeah. can't do it at the last minute. That's why, that's why you have to, you, you get them on board early, just like the resiliency programs and all that other stuff. You, 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 you help them from cradle to grave all the way through, you get them early and you take care of them through while they're in. And that way they have a, they have a better exit strategy on the way out. If that makes sense. Yeah. First program I've heard that actually does that. I give you guys big kudos because, oh. um, and now if you can just bridge that divide of what I was talking about, from oh, yeah. those military friendly and educate them on the, the hard skills and soft skills and how that rung meets across. Holy crap. You've, you've created now like, the path and the yeah. probably the only path of course there probably probably be competitors listening to what you just shared anthony you know going hey man i can i can put this thing together i can do the same thing uh but hey that's the beauty of the whole thing and the and the uh that's uh, the, the way it is world, man. right you know yeah, that's right yeah. challenge you you know yep. bring it on but yep. um 
I really appreciate you taking time and, and sharing not only your military journey, but of course what you're doing to help veterans today as they're they're making the transition. I know you don't look at it as far as the transition thing, but you know, it, like all of us are going to transition at some point in our military career. And like you said, it's either going to be tomorrow because we didn't expect it. It's going to be four years at the end of our enlistment or 30 years or sometime in between because we set that date ourselves. But we also may be surprised that the military created a date for us and and we need to go ahead and have some kind of exit strategy a plan to move forward so that we're taken care of our family's taken care of you know we got food on the table we got a path forward we're doing something we're passionate about and i i really appreciate that what you guys are doing is doing having those conversations on the very front end to lay that path forward and and allowing that individual as they grow within the military to even pivot and change based on new likes, new things that they're witnessing or experiencing. Um, And you're building a hell of a network while doing that by getting in contact with you guys. So, Tony, I appreciate it. Um, I I commend you guys for what you're doing. Wish you nothing but the best out there as well. And uh, like I said, once again, thanks for coming on the show. Hey, Robert, uh, Scott, hey, I really appreciate you you letting me come on and and taking the time and listening to, you know, me – just badger here or talk on, but uh, it's been an absolute honor. And uh, thanks for your service also and everything you guys do uh, when it comes to continuing to uh, mentor and help mentor veterans and taking care of them. So I appreciate it. Thanks a lot, guys. Mm